Hey now, brawlers, it's time for another Board Game Brawl review with Nick Minahan, sponsored by BoardGameBliss.com. Hey now, today we're going to take a look at Cthulhu Realms from Tasty Minstrel Games and designer Darwin Castle. Now that last bit is important because Darwin Castle is the designer of Star Realms and this is a re-theming of that game. He licensed out the base mechanisms of Star Realms to Tasty Minstrel in order to make this new version of it. The theme is uh, Cthulhu. I don't really know any other details other than that. It's just Cthulhu. He's a bunch of stuff that's Cthulhu. Okay. Theme not being the strongest thing of either Star Realms or Cthulhu Realms. But the base mechanisms, like I said, are the same. You are trying to play cards with different colored symbols to get different special abilities in order to defeat all of your opponents. In Star Realms, it was destroy the enemy fleet. In this one, it's make your enemies go insane. But surprisingly, there are quite a few differences in this version. Let me go ahead and give you a brief look at how the game is played. Then we're going to come back. I'll let you know what I think. The goal of Cthulhu Realms is to be either the last person left standing because you have driven all of the other players insane or to have the most sanity remaining when the main deck of cards runs out. Every player is going to have a little sheet in front of them where they can keep track of their sanity with a small tracker that uh, actually looks like a brain. Uh, if you ever get above 55 points, you can just use this little tracker here to keep track of that. Uh, now, the setup that I have here is for a four-player game of Cthulhu Realms, and the reason I say that and why it's important is because if you were only playing a two-player game of Cthulhu Realms, instead of these uh, lineups of cards that you have in between each player, which are randomized cards from the uh, main deck, instead you would only have one row of cards between you and the other player, and you would have five cards in that row. Instead, for a three- or four-player game, you're going to have a row of three cards between each player, and you can only impact and take cards from, conjure cards from, the cards on either side of you. So if I was the main player here, I could only uh, affect the cards in this row and this row. I couldn't do anything about the other two rows. And in fact, it's mainly the players themselves on either side of me who I'm going to be impacting during the course of the game. Now, first and foremost, let me mention that this is a deck building game. If you're not familiar with deck building games, I'll keep it brief. This is a game where every player is going to start off with the same weak deck of cards that you are going to try and make stronger during the course of the game by purchasing, which in this game is called conjuring, the cards that are in these lineups. Whenever you can conjure one of those cards, and I'll explain how all that works in a moment, you're going to take that card, put it into your discard pile. It's immediately going to get replaced from the top of the deck, and eventually, when uh, every turn, you're going to have five cards from your deck and you when you get done with those cards you're going to discard them when it is time for you to draw cards but you no longer have any cards left in your deck instead you're going to reshuffle your entire deck and then draw and then keep drawing until you fulfilled your hand of five cards therefore you are eventually going to draw the more powerful cards that you've been purchasing this whole time and hopefully you'll be weeding out in this case abjuring which is putting back in the box the weak cards that you start off with because they're just not as good as the cards you're going to be purchasing. So let me show you the cards that each player is going to start off with. Uh, first off, every player is going to get two of these initiate cards, which uh, the, uh, there's a lot of iconography in this game, so bear with me, I'll try to make this as simple and painless as possible. Anytime that you see, well first off, anytime that you see this um, sort of blue elder sign symbol up here in the uh, top right corner of the card, that is the cost of the card. Now, most of the starting cards you have just have a cost of zero. The reason why the initiates have a cost of two is because there's actually two extra initiates that are going to start off uh, next to the main deck that people can purchase if they really want to. But uh, And also, if you're playing with less players, you'll actually have more initiates to put into that stack. Uh, but that's always going to be the cost of the card. That's going to be the same for any card. Over here on the left side of the card are the special abilities that this card grants you. Now, in this case, the Initiate is either going to give you plus two abjuring, uh, conjuring power, which means purchasing power. You can use this uh, to add it to your total for the turn in order to buy one of the cards that is on either side of you or directly between you if in the case of a two-player game. And then this represents combat strength, which is essentially your... Uh, making another player, or even yourself, potentially, but you're not going to do that. Um, you're going to make, and then also in a multiplayer game, you're going to make players on either side of you lose one sanity. They'll move down their tracker. However, 
These two arrows in between here mean that you have to do one or the other. You don't get both. If there wasn't these little arrows here, you would get both of these abilities when you play the card. And by the way, uh, you can play as many cards as you want per turn. And when you've played a card, it stays in play and you can, um, it stays in play till the end of the turn. And you can go back and use the abilities whenever you want. You don't have to use them right away until the end of the turn when all the cards you've played get wiped away except for locations. I know that's a lot to take in. We'll get back to that. Uh, then down here, there is another ability you can use. This one is another combat strength uh, that would uh, hurt both of the players next to you or just your one opponent. However, a lot of these cards have requirements, or a lot of these abilities have requirements. In this case, the requirement is that once you've decided to use this ability, you abjure the card back into the box. That red symbol always means abjure. In this case, it means this card goes away, which you probably want to do eventually anyways. Also, this is known as an entity card, meaning it's got this little picture of a person here. There's three types of cards in the game. Entities, locations, and artifacts. This is an entity. So you've got two of those. You also have goons. Goons just have combat strength. They'll uh, reduce your opponent's sanity by one. Uh, then you, you have two of those. And then you have six followers. Followers give you a, a conjuring power plus one. Simple as that. So how the game is going to work is very simply, you'll determine who's going to be the start player. Whoever is the start player is only going to draw three cards from their deck at the start of the game. Uh, the other, if there's only one other player, that player is going to draw five cards. If there is more than uh, two players, the third, and uh, I'm sorry, the middle two players or middle one player is going to draw four cards. So it goes three, four, last player gets to draw five. From then on, you're always going to draw back up to five at the end of your turn after dumping whatever cards are left in your hand, no matter which player you are. So really, very simply, the course of the game is going to be playing cards uh, from you. You'll draw five cards, play cards from your hand, get whatever the special abilities are, possibly make your opponent's drop in sanity or possibly even make yourself gain sanity uh then you sometimes you'll, you'll buy cards put them into your uh discard pile and you'll replenish them immediately sometimes you have to abjure cards which means you're going to kill them so i might do that with my initiates and so on and so forth you're going to keep doing this over and over until you have either the last person standing or the main deck runs out of cards now let me show you some of the other uh, more advanced cards in the game from the general deck just to give you a better idea of what to expect during the course of the game uh so here you have well we'll go through a few entities first you have let me get in there really good sorry you have the uh, Ithian, which costs you three, gives you plus two conjuring power. Uh, it, you, in order, uh, it, you can abjure a card. Now, when you abjure a card normally, when it's just an ability that you can use, you can abjure a card that's in your hand. You can abjure a card that is um, out in one of the lineups or, or from your discard pile as well. If you do one from one of the lineups, then you immediately replace it. Uh, the requirement ability here is actually color-coded. So in addition to the three types of cards, you also have different colors of cards from the general deck. So this is a green entity. And you see here that this card requires, or this ability requires that you have played a green card, and then you can do a combat power of one. Now, this, this does not count for itself. It has to have been that you've played another green card. And it can be before or after, because remember, you don't have to use the ability right away. You just have to have played the card and then use the ability at some point before the end of your turn. Uh, the Migo is another card. It always gets four combat power. You, if you have played a green card, you get two. And if you choose to abjure it back to the box, you get plus three conjuring power. Uh, you have the Hunting Horror. And again, this one lets you abjure a card and it also gives you plus two conjuring power if you've played a green card on top of its normal combat power that it's granting you. And then the Dagon. The Dagon gives you uh, three combat power. You can abjure a card. And if you, this is kind of tough to see. I know these icons can be quite a, a bear. I'll talk about that in my final thoughts. If you've played a green card, and this, what this minus symbol means with the brown square means that if you have discarded a card, or if any other player has discarded a card this turn, if you meet both of those requirements, you may draw a card. That's what the big brown box means with a plus one. And sometimes you'll have, you can, the, well, here, I'll show you right now. These are uh, one of the artifact cards, the king in yellow, which, uh, I'll, I'll skip ahead to these. First, you can use this power to discard a card, which you may want to do, remember, in order to uh, activate effects like the one I just described. And this one lets you get plus one, uh, lets you draw a card, but then you have to draw the card back to the box. But more importantly for this one, you get plus five, or uh, you get combat power, assuming that you have uh, played a location or you have a location 
in play. We'll get back to what locations are in a moment. Uh, the Necronomicon here gets you four combat power. If you've played an orange card, you both draw two cards and you discard a card. And here are our examples of locations. Now, there's three types of locations. Some of them are normal locations. A normal location just has a picture of a train with a number next to it. It gets you uh, plus three. If, if you uh, ab uh, abjure a card during your turn, you get plus three conjuring power. Or, you choose either or, if you've abjured a card, you get plus five combat strength. Now, Relea is, uh, uh, no, I'm not pronouncing that correctly, is an example of a card, I, I can't remember the exact names of them, but think of the outpost from Star Realms. This particular type protects you if this card is still in play. If you have this location and card in play, the other players cannot attack you with sanity attacks unless they destroy this location first, and they can do so. It also, if you've uh, discarded a card, you get to draw a card. And finally, Arkham City is an example of sort of the opposite. In this case, if you have this location in play, other players cannot attack your other locations. They can still attack you until this is, uh, and, and, but if this is destroyed, they can attack your other cities and they can still use effects to destroy the other cities. This one gives you uh, minus, uh, gives you combat power and you can abjure it back to the box to get plus three conjuring power. There are other icons and special abilities, but I think you get the general gist of it. That is Cthulhu Realms. You're trying to drive all the other players insane. Now, let's get to my final thoughts. Now, I do want to make it clear that I really enjoy Star Realms. It was one of my favorite games of last year, and it did not slip into my top 10 deck building games list for this year, but it was definitely a contender. It was just a very crowded field, and I haven't played it in a while, but that's mainly because I, when that game first came out, and especially when the app came out, I played it a ton. I played it too much, and I probably got a little burnt out, but I still really enjoy the game. But I have to tell you, I think the Cthulhu Realms is a better game. I think it works better for me personally for a number of different reasons. I mean, we'll just jump right into it. Starting with the theme and the components, I... I think I like Cthulhu better as a theme than just generic science fiction. Now, this is generic Cthulhu, to be sure, because there's not, like, named characters. You're not taking the role of investigators. I'm not entirely sure how you're what you're supposed to be doing in the game, just, Cthulhu, I'm Cthuluing you, blah, 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 <laughs> okay? But still, as a, I guess, as a concept, I like the idea of Cthulhu better than just the starships from uh, Star Realms, which even there, I'm not really sure what I'm supposed to be doing necessarily, just destroy the enemy ships. Um, as far as the actual artwork goes, I think it's much better in this game. I don't think the art from Star Realms is bad, but again, just generic starships on each of the cards doesn't really do a lot for me. This game has what I would call the goofy style of Cthulhu artwork, and it really works well here. It's very well done. I really liked it. Some of them are genuinely funny the first time I saw them and continue to be, even seeing them multiple times. So I really appreciated that. And as far as the graphic design, layout, things like that, well, I have a bit to say about some of the iconography later on uh, in my final thoughts, but um, I do like the... Uh, or I really prefer the, uh, the scoreboard for each of the players to keep track of sanity as opposed to the cards used to keep track of your, uh, whatever it's called, morale in uh, Star Realms. But I still think it could use improvement. It's much better than the cards, but it's a really tiny token. It's easy to knock and jostle aside when you're on a crowded table with a bunch of cards all around you, especially in a multiplayer game. Um, so I really think the way to go for either of these games is trackers, plastic trackers like Zombieside uses to keep track of experience points. I understand not wanting that's that goes beyond the scope of the game and it's a little bit expensive, but I would probably homebrew that one. That's how much I think it would be better than the solutions they've come up with for either of these respective games. Jumping into the gameplay, the core elements of Star Realms are here: um, the Ascension style randomized row and uh, the color coding of the cards and just, you know, the general deck building elements. They're all here. But after that, this differs pretty drastically, more than I would have suspected. Uh, first off, it's all the different special abilities and their requirements, which you might think, oh, requirements, that's like being way too restrictive. But 
Not really. It actually opens up the game quite a bit. The idea of abjuring the cards, getting rid of them, and then being able to bring them back is a very interesting concept. And having to, uh, the, the drawing and discarding and having those actually be requirements for some of these abilities is not just the color coding. If this was just Star Realms, it would just be, if you played this, this gets a boost. You know, and that's it. In this case, not only do you give things a boost, but you get you know, whole other abilities and as well as a multitude of other abilities at the same time. Like a card might be really good at combat, but then if you do this restriction, you get to draw a card. And if you do this restriction, you get to make someone else discard a card. And all these different things really add a lot to the game. Not to mention that the fact that uh, locations are now more nuanced. Now you have locations that only protect you, the player, and locations that only protect your other locations, which really solved a problem that I had with Star Realms over time, which is that if someone gets a really killer outpost early in the game, outposts and Star Realms being the ones that just protect you, th that was just awesome. That was like game changing. So I really appreciated that. Um, and you still have the normal locations if you want, but they're, they're not nearly as game-breaking as they used to be while still being pretty powerful, and you do want to go for them. Uh, but I do like that the color change system is still there. It's just not as huge a part. So all these little elements seem to work much better than they did in Star Realms. Just add more to the game. Not to mention the fact that I appreciate that every player now starts off with a couple of initiates, which are the essentially like the scout ships from Star Realms. But it gives you that extra boost because it gets the game going faster. It's still the same uh, sort of pace for most of the game, but in the beginning, things are just a little more exciting and just, you know, keeps the game going at a good clip. And you can get rid of them very, very easily. The same with your other cards, because there's tons of ways to abjure cards in this game, to destroy them permanently. So really appreciate that. Uh, in fact, I would say, though, the biggest uh, plus for the game is the fact that right out of the box, multiplayer. And it works, and it works well, and in fact, I would probably recommend playing this game with four players above the other player counts. That's how well it works. In Star Realms, there was multiplayer, but you had to buy at least two decks, and you wouldn't want to play with more than four and buy three decks because the game goes on way too long. But even with up to four players, it just didn't work that well. If you just played a free-for-all, that was just like, hey, it's everyone getting up on one person. Now let's gang up on this person, and then we're left, right? Uh, I mean, that's a little simplistic, but that's eventually what these kind of things devolve into. Then you had two-on-two -two team matches, and that's like, well, okay, but it's still not adding anything that new. There's like a one-versus-all mode that was just pretty unbalanced. So none of the multiplayer modes for Star Realms really worked for me. This way works really, really well, how they do it in Cthulhu Realms, with the, the lineups of cards between the different players, and you're only interacting with the players on your left and right, and then it narrows down, and as people drop out, you start to interact with more players. It just keeps things going at a very good pace. You have lots of options. It works very, very well, and the games are still fast, and I do think... Three players is a bit awkward. I did try it with that because right off the bat, you're just there with the other players. And it can turn into that free-for-all thing I was talking about before. But with four players, I think it works very, very well. And it's, I would say, even better than two players. So that is the main reason why I think I would recommend this one over Star Realms. Problems with the game, I would say the card pool is not deep enough. This can easily be fixed with an expansion, but until then, you know, if I play this game another 10 times, I can definitely see myself getting like, <sighs> again, you know, the same cards over and over and over again. Now, getting 10 plays out of a game is definitely solid, especially for what is a, a very cost-effective game, but still, I want to see more stuff. I, you know, even now, I want to see more stuff, and hopefully that comes, especially if you're playing multiplayer all the time, you're going to see the same cards over and over again. Uh, also, and I mentioned, I alluded to this earlier, the iconography. Now, I understand sacrificing uh, some you know, clear text on all the cards in order to make the game look better visually. And it works very well, if you could tell my overview. Just having the icons on the side and having beautiful full artwork on the other side, it does work well. I think I would have sacrificed some of that just to have text on the cards. Because at least for the first few games, it was a pain constantly looking in the book to see what the symbols meant. It seems intuitive to me now, and I know because I know the game very well. But until I got to that point, I thought that it was just frustrating. So I think that's like a small barrier of entry. It's the kind of thing that really bugged me about, say, Race for the Galaxy. Um, and again, not a huge deal. You can get over it eventually. But I think more intuitive symbols, or just getting rid of the symbols, or pairing them up with text, would have been better. But 
ultimately, the faults of this game are relatively minor, and it's still very, very solid. And I think it kills Star Realms for me. It's that good. I mean, Star Realms is still great, but the little tweaks to this one, together with the theme and the artwork, just rise it just above Star Realms for me. I really hope, honestly, both games get desperately need an expansion. This one, perhaps more so, but if it gets an expansion, forget it. I'll never touch Star Realms again. That's how good this one is, and I wouldn't be surprised if this one creeps into my top 10 deck building games list next year. That is Cthulhu Realms from Tasty Minstrel Games. Highly recommend it. If you don't like Cthulhu, you'll maybe go for Star Realms, but if you do like Cthulhu, go for this one. I don't think you'll be disappointed. Thanks for watching. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Patreon. And make sure to check out our sponsor, Board Game Bliss, where you can find an amazing selection of games from around the world. BoardGameBliss.com. Thanks for your support.